All right, so thank you for joining me once again for our pastor's Bible study. You know, I've been praying a lot these last several weeks about what direction this study ought to take. And we started with uh, some questions and answers and sort of a what does the Bible say about series, and we, we dealt with some topics. Uh, and then we had la a couple weeks ago, we had, uh, I just, the Lord laid something on my heart as we were, I was doing my reading out of the Version Bible reading plan. If you're not connected to that, I encourage you to get connected to our community-wide uh, Bible reading plan. So contact me, Pastor Daviano Baptist Church, if you're not connected to that. But two weeks ago, the Lord really laid something on my heart as I was doing my quiet time about something he had for me to say in a, in a message that I passed on to you in that lesson. Last week, I apologize. I, I just was busy. I had a lot of things going on, a lot of things happened, and I just wasn't able to get a lesson and prepared and pulled together. But I've been praying about what direction this ought to take. And so I decided that I really kind of felt like the Lord leading me to, to, to kind of go through a a series on some basic Christian doctrines. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some, some topics of what do we believe? And I think that even if you are a regular in church, and I hope that you are, I hope you have a Bible-believing church that you attend every Sunday, and whether that's Aviano Baptist Church or not, I hope you have a place where you regularly get together with the family of God. We all need that. We need that encouragement. We need that constant reminder, that time of corporate worship. I hope you have that. But if you spend a lot of time in church, you grew up in church, or even if you, if you haven't, it's important, I think, for us to once in a while, even those who have been in church a long time, to take a step back and say, what do we believe and why do we believe it? I think that's a valuable exercise for us to remind ourselves of some of these beautiful truths that we have in Scripture. And so over these next several weeks, we're going to be kind of following along this book here. Uh, this book is called 20 Basics Every Christian Should Know. Man, that's a great title, isn't it? You know, just to read that title and say, okay, well, I, I really want to know these things. 20 basics every Christian should know. And this book is written by a man named Wayne Grudem. Now, Wayne Grudem has been a professor, a seminary professor of Bible and theology for 40 years now. And I don't agree with absolutely everything that Wayne Grudem has to say on every single topic, but when it comes to issues of basic Christian doctrine, there are few people more qualified to speak or to write on that than Wayne Grudem. And so we're going to use his book as a basis for this study. He has written in the course of his, his teaching time, he's written, written a thick theology book. It's about this thick. Um, and, and I kind of look at this book here as kind of the cliff notes of that theology book. And so we're going to cover some topics, um, like it's from the table of contents. We're going to cover some topics. It starts off with what is the Bible? But we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, so we're not going to circle back on that one again. I do encourage you, if you didn't see it, or if you just want to refresh your memory, go back and check out that, that uh, study we did a couple weeks ago on what is the Bible. But he's got some topics like, what is God like? We're going to talk about that tonight and then for the next couple of weeks as well. What is God like? What is the Trinity? When we talk in church, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, what are we talking about? What is this, the significance of that? What is creation? We talked about whether the Bible and evolution are compatible a few weeks ago, but what do we learn from the creation account? Not just about whether evolution is true or not, but what do we learn about God from the creation account? What is prayer? When we have a prayer life, what is really going on there? And Who is man? What is sin? Who is Jesus? 20 topics in total that he covers, and we may cover them all. Uh, we may just have some selective topics. And so my intent would be that we'll cover those topics until we run out, we finish the book, or until you send me a note and say, enough, Pastor, I'm through with that. Let's go on and do something else. 
So tonight, I want us to start with the first topic in that book, and that is the topic of what is God like? Now, as I said, we're going to cover this over the next couple of weeks. This is a big, big, big topic because he is a big, big, big God. And I, we, you know, I try to keep these lessons at about 30 minutes or so. Um, and so I don't want us to, to spend, we can't, we, can't constant, we can't possibly go through everything. There is to go through about what is God like. Even if we had hours and hours and days and months and years to cover, we simply could not exhaust that topic. But I want to keep these lessons at about 30 minutes, and so I'm going to try to, to keep an eye on the time um, so that we can, we can have a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so we'll cover this topic in several chunks over the next several weeks. You know, when we talked about the Bible a couple weeks ago, we talked about this as being God's revelation to man, and we use that terminology. We, we talk about it that way a lot, that the Bible is God-breathed. It's his very words to us, and, and when we read this, when we open up this book, we read a lot of stories, right? We're reading in our community Bible reading plan the story of the Exodus, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. We read that story. We read the, the story today's reading was all the Ten Commandments, when God gave his law to the people. And then we, we fast forward and we read stories like David and Goliath and, and Joshua and the, the Battle of Jericho. And, and we read stories about Jonah and the great fish. And we move into the New Testament and we read all of these great stories about Jesus and his ministry in the Gospels and Paul and, and his missionary journeys in the book of Acts. And, you know, when we're reading all of those stories, God didn't give us those stories for entertainment purposes or just to give us a historical account of the church or the nation of Israel, although they do, they are entertaining stories, and they do give us this historical account, that is true. But he gave us these stories because they reveal what God is like. When we see him interacting with the children of Israel in the Exodus, and they're wandering in the wilderness. We learn some things about what God is like. When we see him deliver them through Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, we learn some things about what God is like. Daniel in the lion's den, we learn some things about God. Jesus throughout the Gospels, we learn some more things about God. When we're reading these stories, we're learning about what God is like. And so I want us to see a few things about what the Bible tells us about what God is like. By the way, I encourage you to have your Bible with you when we're doing this. This is, this is a Bible study. These are topical lessons. So we're not going to take one book of the Bible and just go through it. These are very topical lessons. And we're going to cover a lot of ground in Scripture. And I don't have all the passages pre-marked, so I'll be flipping around finding them just the same as you are. And so that gives you time to find them so we can look at them together, we can read them together. And this can truly be a time when we dig into the Word of God and see what does the Bible have to say about what God is like? What do we learn about Him through the pages of Scripture? Okay, so that's enough introduction. Let me, let me say a brief word of prayer, then let's jump into this lesson about what the Bible really does uh, tell us about what God is like. So let's pray. Father, thank you that we have an opportunity to know you through your word. And so, Lord, I pray tonight as we open up your word, as we talk about what you're like, as we learn just a few things and a, and a few thoughts about what you revealed to us, Father, would you teach us and help us to know and help us to grow in our understanding and our relationship with you. We pray that you would be our teacher and our guide tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what is God like? What does the Bible tell us about that? Well, the first thing that we learn about God from the Bible is simply that he exists. Now, I know that seems almost too obvious to have to say it, right? Well, of course God exists. Would we be even be talking about this? We wouldn't even be having this lesson if God didn't exist. And it seems almost too obvious, but it has to be stated at first that God does exist. We, we learn that very plainly from the Bible. 
And there are some in our world, we call them atheists. They don't believe in God. They don't believe that he exists. They believe he's a myth that was made up. He's a crutch that people have made up so they have something to lean on. But the Bible approaches God's existence just very matter-of-factly. In fact, you won't find proof of God's existence, not even in the Bible. The Bible doesn't set out to prove God exists. God doesn't owe us proof. He doesn't owe us that kind of evidence. The Bible is just simply very matter of fact. It simply assumes God's existence. I was, several years ago, I was having a debate of sorts with a friend of my niece. Now, this young man is an atheist. And we were having this debate over Facebook Messenger, and we got to this question of, he, he demanded proof. He said, I, I need proof of God's existence. Can you prove that he exists? And I would talk about how, like we talked about when we were looking at the lesson about evolution, how we look around nature, we see a whole lot of evidence that points to God's existence. The way things all fit together and the fact that it all so perfectly feeds us and, and sustains us and how the creator of that must have been perfect and powerful. And it pointed all those things out, but he just kept demanding, it's not proof, it's not proof, I need proof. We're not going to find proof of God's existence, in the, not even in the Bible. Genesis 1.1, the very first sentence of the Bible, simply states like this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's matter of fact. It doesn't attempt to prove. It doesn't even try to say, okay, in the beginning, God. Now, let me stop here and prove and tell you all the reasons why you ought to believe in God. Let me prove his existence. It doesn't do that because God doesn't owe us proof of his existence. We have enough here to believe in him. We have enough evidence within the pages of Scripture, within even, as the Bible says, within even nature itself, to realize that God exists. So God doesn't need to prove anything to us. In fact, Friedrich Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, that's the proper pronunciation, German philosopher, late 1800s, he died in 1900. He was an atheist philosopher, and he said this. He said, if one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less able to believe in him. See, we shouldn't look for proof of God's existence. God is not like something we can put in a lab, you know, and something we can put in a test tube and, and test him and examine him and, and come up with some proof that he exists. And if he were, I think Nietzsche would be right. If we could come up with some solid proof of God's existence, then we would have to question, is he really the God who is revealed in the Bible? Now, though we can't prove his existence, God has provided us enough evidence in this life and enough evidence in his word to convince anyone who is willing to believe. Now, that's an important aspect. And we hear people say all the time that I can't believe in God because I can't touch him. I can't see him. I can't smell him. I can't physically know that he's here, right? I don't see him right in front of me. And so I can't believe in something I can't see. I can't believe in something I can't touch. It was Billy Graham that once said, I've never seen the wind. Right? And you think about it, you have never seen the wind. But none of us question whether it exists or not. You can't see air. You can't touch air. You can't grab a hold of air. But none of us question whether it exists. Billy Graham went on, he said, I've never seen the wind. I've seen the effects of the wind. And that tells me that the wind exists. And though there is an element of our, our will that has to believe that God exists, it's not just head knowledge. 
The Bible's given us enough evidence in life and in his, the Bible gives us enough evidence to convince anyone who is willing to believe. But on the flip side of that, God has left enough ambiguity so that he's not forcing anyone to believe in him. If there are those who are unwilling, like that young man that I was having a debate with, I must have proof, I must have proof, I must have proof. Someone who is unwilling to believe like him. God has left enough ambiguity so that anyone who is unwilling to believe will not be forced to believe. But we come to the Bible in just that very first sentence and we say, God exists. That's one of the things we learn about God from the Bible. That's one of the things about what God is like. He simply does exist. And God tells us some significant things about the existence of God. So I'm going to ask you to turn over to the New Testament book of Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 has some things to say about God's existence. And we looked a little bit at this when we were looking at the evolution argument. But Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 25, and I'm going to read it and then we'll talk about it just a little bit. And Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 19, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. In other words, we can look around and there's some things about God that are evident, and he's designed it that way. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that we are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And therefore God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity, that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature, the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, when you read those words in Romans chapter 1, you realize that God has told us an awful lot about Himself from that passage. He's told us, first of all, that He has provided us enough information already to know that he exists. But what are some of the things? That's not really the, the, the question or the topic that we're dealing with tonight. The topic we're dealing with is what is he like? Yes, he exists. We, we understand that, but what is he like? And we learned some things from this passage about what God is like. First of all, we learn that he is the creator. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, this is in verse 20, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. We learn that he is the creator of all things. We learn that he's sovereign, that he's divine because he's created everything. His divine attributes, his eternal power. Well, that speaks in terms that you and I don't have. That's some kind of authority. That's some kind of power that you and I as human beings simply don't have. His divine nature, we learn about that from, from just looking around. And those are enough to realize that God has the absolute right over our lives. He has complete authority over us because he is, he is our creator. He's not only created us, but he's created everything. He is the potter and we are the clay. And the potter has absolute authority over whatever, whatever is going to happen with that lump of clay. So we learn some things about God. He's creator, he's sovereign, he's divine. He has authority over our lives. He is perfect and far above us. But we, we learn that just from looking around nature, just from what the Bible says. And then over in, 
in verse 20, last part of verse 20. He said, because of all of that, that he has revealed all of that to us, that we learn all of that about what God is like from this passage and from nature, God is absolutely just in declaring that we have no excuse to not know about him. We have no excuse to not know that God exists. We have no excuse to not know he is divine. He is the creator. He is perfect. We are without excuse. Because as he goes on to say in verse 25, those who would be unwilling to accept that God exists and accept what God is like, he says in verse 25, they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They have actively gone out of their way to deny God's existence. That's why he's just in declaring that we are without excuse. Okay, so we recognize some things about God's existence. Now, I want us to think, though, why is it important for us to recognize, when we talk about what God is like, why is it important for us to recognize that God exists? To start with that, and I've spent a lot of time on that one issue, the existence of God. But why is it important to recognize that God exists? Well, first of all, it acknowledges the truth of Scripture. When the very first line of the Bible says, In the beginning God, and it assumes He exists, very matter-of-factly states that He exists, it acknowledges the truthfulness of Scripture. Listen, if the first sentence of the Bible is not true, right? If God didn't exist, and in the beginning God didn't create. If the very first sentence of the Bible is not true, then why should we read any of the rest of it? And so to, to recognize that God exists, it merely acknowledges that it acknowledges for us the truthfulness of Scripture. And it answers some key questions for us. For question number one, where did we come from, right? That's the question we were dealing with in the issue of evolution. That's the question that has been, been on man's mind for, for hundreds of years, certainly since Darwin published that book in the late 1800s. Where did we come from? The Bible answers that question. We recognize that God exists. We have an answer. It answers the question of our identity. Who are we? Where do we fit? Are we different than dogs and cats? Who are we? It answers one of the key questions that mankind has been asking for thousands of years. Why are we here? Does our existence in this, on this earth, does this life have any meaning? Does our life have any purpose? Knowing that God exists helps us make sense of that question. Knowing that God exists gives us an idea, a framework of morality. What is right and wrong? How should we be living? You know, that's one of the reasons why Charles Darwin, in the, in the theory of evolution, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that's one of the reasons why this has grabbed a hold so much, because if we can remove God from the picture, we, can, we, we remove his morality from the picture. That's why the, the heart of man so desperately wants to demand proof of God's existence. Because if I don't acknowledge that God exists, I don't recognize that I'm under his morality. I can say anything goes. I can do what's right in my own eyes. Recognizing God exists helps us answer the question of morality. And then it helps us answer the question of destiny. Not just why are we here on this earth, but what happens when we're not on this earth? Every one of us is going to die. Someone once said it this way, that life has a 100% mortality rate. And when that day comes for every one of us, what's going to happen to us? Is there life after death? And what does that look like? And, and how can I ensure that I go to heaven and not go to hell? answers the question of destiny. It affirms that our life has meaning and purpose 
Listen, if there is no God, our lives have no purpose. I mean, that's one of the, one of the key questions. One of the things that people are looking for to, to know that, that their life here, we're not just spinning around on this rock for 70 or 80 years, and when we die, we die. And there was no, no meaning to it, no purpose to it, no reason for it. Listen, if there's no purpose to life, there's no significance. And if there is no significance, it really doesn't matter what we do here, what we achieve here, what we don't achieve. It just doesn't make any difference. What a miserable, hopeless way to live. That's exactly why the, the enemy is taking such great pains to convince the world that God doesn't exist because if God doesn't exist, if we, if we come to that, if we believe that, then we're not accountable to anyone greater than ourselves. Well, the first thing, I know I spent a lot of time on it tonight and, and our time is almost done here. The first thing though we learn from Scripture is that God simply exists. And I just want to cover one more topic tonight and then we'll pick it up next week and that is the other thing one of the other things that we begin to know about God what is God like is that God is knowable you know there are some people that believe that that God is out there he's distant he's far away uh, he just sort of put us here and then he leaves us to to our to our own devices and that we can't know him and he doesn't really know us. He's not concerned about what's going on here. But when we open the pages of Scripture, the one thing that we can't escape is that first that God exists, but that God is knowable. Not completely. We will never know everything there is to know about God. I think if, if we did, if God were to put all of that knowledge about himself into our heads, I think our heads would explode. We can't know everything about God. We can't know Him completely, but we can know Him sufficiently. We can know enough about Him. I mean, we see even in the pages of Scripture, God is not fully knowable. Take in your Bibles and turn back to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55 and I had stuck my finger in just in my Bible as I was holding it like this, and I, I stuck it into the book of Jeremiah. So I was just one book ahead, so I was able to quickly turn back to the book of Isaiah. I'll give you a second to turn there, but here in Isaiah chapter 55, we think about this idea of God not being fully knowable. And, and this is what it says, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. This is really God speaking through Isaiah. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That's the way it ought to be, right? I mean, that's not really a problem. It should be that way. If God is, all of those things that we saw in Romans chapter 1, he is the creator. He is the, the sovereign, divine, all-powerful king of the universe. If God really is those things, his thoughts should be higher than our thoughts. His ways should be higher than our ways. It's not a problem that we can't know everything about God. That's the way it ought to be. He's not fully knowable, but he is personally knowable knowable. We can know some things about God, but we simply can't know everything about God. And I want to wrap up our time tonight really thinking about this idea that God is not fully knowable, but he is personally knowable. My wife and I are dog people. If you know Jeannie and I, you know we are dog people. And we had a, a sad moment uh, this past weekend. We had to say goodbye to our beloved Vizzini. Uh, we had him as part of our family for seven years, and we were so blessed uh, to have him. He was our dachshund, our wire-haired dachshund beagle mix, um, and he lived with us for seven years and was just an absolute joy to us, but he went on to be with the Lord on Saturday. 
And so it's been a very sad time for us, but we still have one dog in our home, our little chihuahua named Bruno. We are dog people. We will always have dogs around our house. And, and there's something about dogs that though we can, we can have a little bit of a relationship with them and they can have a little bit of a relationship with us, they can't really understand us, you know? They really, they really, there's no possibility. We're so beyond them that they simply don't have the ability to comprehend why we do what we do or how we go about things or how we make decisions. Our dog, as much as he loves us, as much as we love him, he doesn't have the capacity to understand us. And that really is the same way it is with us and God. We simply don't have, within our finite minds, we absolutely don't have the capacity to understand everything there is to know about God. He's not fully knowable, but he is personally knowable. And I want to pick up our conversation next time, next week, when we, when we start back into our study. I want to pick it up right there. God is personally knowable. And I want us to talk about some of the things that we know, ways that God communicates with us so that we can know him and what that tells us about who God is. Well, I hope this has been a, a blessed time of at least starting this conversation tonight about what is God like. I would encourage you to go back and, and study that Romans 1 passage. Just read over that again and really ask God, God, would you help me to see the fullness of who you are through that passage? And as you think about that passage in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, God, when I think about your ways higher than my ways, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. When there are times in my life when, when, I, when I have more questions than answers, I can lean on that and say, God, I don't understand everything you're doing, but I trust your heart. And I trust that this has been a blessed time for you tonight. I hope you have a fantastic week. I know we have a holiday weekend coming up this weekend, but I, stu I still do hope that you're planning to make church attendance a part of your weekend activities, and so I hope we'll see you on Sunday. The reservation system's already open, so you can go out on the Facebook page. I shared it in WhatsApp this afternoon. You can go out and make your reservations for Sunday and reserve your spots. I hope we'll see you in service on Sunday. I hope this has been a blessing, and I hope you have a wonderful week.